Hi, this is Pastor Josh, and I just want to thank you for watching or listening to these teachings. Our hope is that through these teachings that you would learn more about God and grow closer to Him in relationship. But we also hope that these would be an additional teaching to what you already receive in your church home. If you don't have a church home, we would love to have you here at Cornerstone. So we do pray that through these teachings that you would hear God through the proclamation of His Word. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the book of Philippians this morning once again. So go ahead and make your way there if you have your Bible. Last week we began the book of Philippians. We're going through a series in Philippians. It's we preach preaching through the entire book of Philippians. And I did joke one week that it's a really long book, but if you look at it, it's only four chapters. It's really short. And, and so as you're turning, they'll remind you that Paul, the apostle, is writing to the church in Philippi here. Last week in, in verses 1 through 11, we saw Paul's affection, his confidence, and his purpose for this church. And that was displayed in his joyful prayer to God. And so this morning we're in Philippians 1, verse 12, and I know you sat down once again, but may we rise in honor of reading God's word. Verse 12 through 18 this morning is our passage. And the word of God says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated as we go to him in prayer. Our Father, this is the time in which we open up your word, in which we expound upon your word. And so we are reminded that it is, in fact, your word, not just simply a book that's found in the library, but this is your word to us, your message to us, your message for our own lives. Father, we are so confused at times, so perplexed at times, so busy at times, so unaware at times, Lord. And so, Father, in this moment, would you draw us to your word? Would you clarify what it means? Would you help us to cast aside all the things on our mind that we would simply focus on what you say this morning for these next moments? Father, this may be the only time some of us ever get in the word. And so, Lord, would you use it to bless your name? And so, God, would you be with me? as I proclaim your truth and help me to get out of the way, but only lead me by your spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Well, in the Old Testament, we have the testimony of a man named Joseph. Maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. But Joseph was one of the youngest of 12 brothers. He was included in that 12. His father, Israel, his name was Jacob before that, but his name was changed to Israel. That was his father, and his father had showed a little favoritism to him. So his brothers were upset with him. And you know, if you have siblings, the baby of the family usually gets the attention, it usually is that person. And so Joseph was one of the babies. Benjamin was the youngest. And so one day, Joseph goes out into the field to find his brothers, and his brothers see him coming, and they plan to kill him. I said that correctly. They planned to kill Joseph. Now, I've seen some pretty bad things in families and some siblings. I've never seen that. 
but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I know it does exist, and maybe you've even experienced that in your own life. That kind of destructive nature between siblings, that's what was going on for Joseph. So when he came out and they planned to kill him, the oldest brother said, no, let's not kill him. And so they ended up throwing him into a hole, into a pit. And later on, they ended up selling him into slavery. And so Joseph finds himself in Egypt. And while in Egypt, he gets the opportunity to serve one of the main officers. And so he's in his house serving him and and, and cleaning and doing these sorts of things for him. And that officer's wife tries to mess around with Joseph. And Joseph is like, I'm not having this. This is not what I'm not trying to do these things. So Joseph flees. He runs out of this place. And when he runs, she has his jacket, his outer coat. And so she's thinking to herself, oh, I'm caught now. So what does she do? She manipulates the situation. She goes to her husband and says, Joseph was trying to mess around with me. And so I screamed and he was trying to leave, but I grabbed his jacket. And so Joseph now finds himself in prison in Egypt. What a bad situation. I mean, Joseph hadn't even really done anything. And now he finds himself in these situations. Imagine you, if you were a fellow prisoner with him, and you came and sat down by him and you said, hey, I'm Josh or I'm Mary or Laura, whatever your name is. And you say, hey, so what are you in for? Well, why are you in prison? And he's like, well, to be honest, when I was an older teenager, I went out to visit my brothers in the field and they threw me into the hole. They were trying to kill me, but they didn't. They threw me into a hole and then they sold me into slavery. I ended up here in Egypt. I was working for the main officer. And then his wife tried to mess around with me. I ran away. And then she said she flipped the story around. And now I'm here. Like, wow, that is a bad turn of events for you. I bring to light that story this morning because it's similar to what Paul is going through. Look at what he says in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What has happened to me? Well, what has happened to Paul? We know that he's imprisoned. Verse 13, he goes, I am in my imprisonment. In verse 14, in the middle of it, he has my imprisonment. In verse 17, he says it again, in my imprisonment. So Paul finds himself in prison. Now, just like Joseph, and and we'll see a little bit more about Paul, we need to ask ourselves the question, if I was Joseph, what would my attitude be in that situation? How would I feel? The question we should ask is this. How does God want us to respond in these situations? That's the question we ask. And we're going to see the answer. God will give us the answer in this passage this morning. So Paul finds himself imprisoned. What is he imprisoned for? He's imprisoned for preaching the gospel. Think about this. He is arrested and he's put in jail for proclaiming Jesus. He didn't break any of the laws, not necessarily. He didn't go murder anyone. He didn't steal. He didn't take anything from the market. He wasn't doing any of these things. He was simply talking about Jesus and they arrested him and put him in prison. You've got to understand something about Paul. Paul was a man who was a very righteous Jewish man, very legalistic. He was trying to be made right with God by following the law, by following and being obedient to these things. Sounds familiar in our days of how we get to God is by doing all these things. That's what Paul was trying to do. And then Christ revealed himself. Jesus revealed himself to Paul, and he says, Paul, what are you doing? Quit trying to work yourself right with God. I make you right with God, not you. And so Paul was changed by Jesus. That sounds familiar to a, a word that we say, a disciple. What is a disciple? 
Someone who's changed by Jesus, conforming to Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. Paul was changed by Jesus. In a moment when he realized who Jesus was, he says, I don't have to work for this. Jesus did it all. Jesus was perfect and righteous, and he gives me that righteousness, and my sin I have given to him. That's why he died on the cross. And that moment he was changed, forgiven, and made a child of God, and he realized that. But he also realized he was not yet done. He had not yet finished. He had not yet lived out this truth reality into his life. And so he began to conform to Jesus. He wanted to look like Jesus in every possible way of his life. And part of that means being committed to his mission. So he's committed to Jesus' mission, which we'll see in a couple of weeks in Philippians 2, that Christ came to serve us. And to proclaim this truth, so Paul is now out there preaching Jesus. He's telling everybody about Jesus. He's going from city to city and region to region, place to place, telling people about Jesus because he's been changed and he's seeking to conform and he wants to be committed to this mission. This is what's going on. But he's doing this in the midst of a Roman government. Now, if you've ever seen anything about Roman governments, you'll know how strict they are, how powerful they are and what they did to people who disobeyed their government. So he's doing this in the midst of that. Now the Romans, at this point in time, they didn't have a big, big problem with him. This is why. Because they allowed the Jewish religion in their government, or as far as being allowed, and Christianity was so new It had the same sayings uh, of God and the law and and these sorts of things that for so long these Roman people thought that Christianity was actually Judaism, and it wasn't. But because of that umbrella that it looked like Judaism, they allowed it. But Jewish people were very upset with Christianity. Paul was once one of these men. He was out taking names and, and trying to get these people destroyed because they were proclaiming false things about God. That is, until he came to the reality of who Jesus actually was. So Paul's preaching Jesus in the midst of a a legalistic Jewish religion who hates Jesus, who are the ones who killed Jesus, and in the midst of a Roman government that that worshiped many, many gods, and that if you get out of line, if if you cause a chaos, if you cause an uprising, they will put an end to you. So at some point, either the Jewish people set him up or the Roman people came or a mixture of the two. We don't know for sure, but we know that something happened for him preaching Jesus that he got arrested and put in prison for simply preaching Jesus, not for doing anything at all. There's many countries in our world where that's the reality today. And I'll be clear here. Don't be surprised if it happens in America in our lifetime. For being put in prison for talking about Jesus. That's what happens to Paul. So he says, in my imprisonment. Now think about that. Paul's in prison. He's preaching city to city, region to region, place to place. He wants to tell everybody about Jesus, and they're trying to make him be quiet, to shut him up. So what do they do? Arrest him and put him up. So so if you were Paul, you would expect him to say something like, I'm so sad and I'm upset by this that I can't go out and tell everybody about Christ. They locked me down. But prison isn't something that's totally new to him. Turn in your Bible to your, to your left just a few pages in 2 Corinthians. I want to show you something about Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, about halfway through. It's just a few pages to your left. Paul says this. He's writing to the, to the church in Corinth here. And this is very likely written before Philippians is written. Watch what he says about what he's gone through. I am talking like a madman. This is in the middle of 23 on verse, chapter 11. With far great labors, ready? Far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. 
Five times I received at the hands of the Jews. There you go, Jewish religion, hating him. The 40 lashes less one. So five times he's been whipped on his back, 39 times every time. So 40 times five is 200 minus five. It's 195. So Paul's been beaten on his back with whips 195 times. Think about what his back looked like. If you have ever seen pictures of some of the slaves that had been beaten and how they had scars all over their back, that's what Paul's back would have looked like. Think about how you feel when your back is that way. The pain that he would have. The turmoil that he would have. Scar tissue is not flexible, doesn't bend easily. So maybe now he's hunched over or, or at an angle. He has problems. He's been beaten for proclaiming Jesus. Verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. They threw rocks at me. Three times I was shipwrecked. Means the ship broke in the middle of the sea. Three times that's happened to him while he was trying to go preach about Jesus. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. He was, he was holding on to just some random wood from the ship floating in the middle of the sea. Verse 26, frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from these Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, though many a sleepless night in hunger and in thirst, often without food in cold and exposure. This is the display of what Paul was doing. Paul was out there committed to Jesus because he wanted to conform to Jesus because he had been changed by Jesus and he's trying to let everyone else know the good news. So much to the point that even if he gets whipped on his back, he's still going to proclaim Christ. Even if his, sea, uh, if his ship breaks down in the middle of the sea and he's trying to stay afloat, he's going to proclaim Christ. You cannot stop him. So you would expect, if you didn't know these things, if you just heard about Paul being in prison and he's out there preaching the gospel, that he would maybe be upset, that he would say, I can't preach the gospel anymore because I'm in prison, because they've hindered me, they have made me be quiet, and now I'm in this little cell and can't talk to anybody. But that's not what happens to him. And just think about this for a moment, okay? Listen very closely to this. This is what Paul went through. Paul, one of the most faithful men that we know, Paul, one of the men, men that was closest to God in which we read about. Paul, the guy who pretty much wrote most of the New Testament by himself through God's inspiration. This is his nearness to God. And this is the things in which he goes to. You ready for it? Christianity is not a promise that you'll live a comfortable life. It's not. We, we think it is. But it's absolutely false. The scriptures do not say that. What does Jesus say? If you follow me, deny yourself, that is to give up yourself for everything else, for others and people. To deny yourself is a hard thing. When was the last time you just served everybody out of gladness? I really want to do this for you and do this, and I don't really care about myself. It's hard. And Jesus says, deny yourself. And he says, be prepared to die on the cross with me. The cross, that, this, that was the, one of the things in the Roman government at that time. That they would put you on the cross so that when people walked by, they would say, oh, I'm not going to do that, or I'm not doing this. So you would walk by all these criminals coming into the city. The Roman government was doing that. The Jewish belief understood this to be a curse. And so Jesus comes and says, look, if you want to follow me, if you want to be a Christian, if you want these things for your life, understand it's not going to be comfortable at all times. Deny yourself. Be prepared to die. That's what he says. John 15, he says this, they hated me first. Don't you think that they're going to hate you? If they killed me, which he'll say later on, don't you think that they will come after you. Think about the rich young ruler. This rich young man comes to Jesus. Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Have you obeyed the law? I've done these things. I've done these things. Okay, good. And then he says, Jesus says this to him. Okay, you have one more thing. Go and sell everything that you have. Wait, 
Are you sure, Jesus? When was the last time that you, someone invited you to Jesus that way? Hey, Jesus loves you and he wants you to follow you. You just got to do one thing. Go sell everything you have. That's shocking. But to this rich young man, Jesus knew that he was finding his treasure and his hope and his life in these riches, in his money, that if he had a problem, he could just pay for it. And so Jesus says, give that up and trust me. That's what it's about. That's not comfortable, is it? Wait, you want me to give it up? Think about your life. What is God asking you to give up in order to follow him? And notice how Jesus says that. Jesus doesn't want him to give those things up because Jesus is this Debbie Downer of, oh, you can't have this and you can't do this and I don't want this for you. Jesus wants this person to give these things up because he knows that life is not found in those things. That life is only found in Jesus Christ. So this morning, if Jesus is asking you to give something up, it's not because he's a Debbie Downer and he wants to just put his hand upon you and, and make you feel bad about these things. He wants you to embrace what true life is all about. And it's not found in any of those things. It's only found in him. He says this. Those who find your life will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Stephen was stoned to death. They threw rocks at him to the point where he died because he was a Christian. So do not tell me that Christianity is a promise for a comfortable life. It is not a promise for a comfortable life. You ready for this? But Christianity is a promise of eternal life and abundant life. John 3.16, eternal life. It is a promise that you will live in eternity with God. Now that's comforting to know. And God doesn't just want you to look to the future. God doesn't want you to just kind of mosey along in your life right now until you get to that age or something happens and you, you pass on and you get to be with him. He's saying, no, John 10, 10, he goes, I want you to have abundant life, full life now. You need to know what is it about now. This is the greatest um, gap in which I see in churches today. People do not comprehend what it looks like to live an abundant, full life now. Jesus didn't just die for your future. He died for your present. He loves you now. And if you're saying in your life, well, I'm kind of bored or, or I'm upset or these sorts of things, then you're not living the way that Christ wants you to live. And he doesn't want you to seek the comforts of this world. He wants you to seek him. So Paul's in prison here. Not seeking the comforts of the world. He understands that Christianity is not a comfortable thing at all times. It can be at times, but not at all times. He expects himself that he could die one day. He knows these things. This is the basic 101 Christianity that you must comprehend when you come to the faith. I say it wasn't easy to lose all my friends in high school because I loved Jesus. It wasn't easy to be made fun of because I quit drinking alcohol and they looked at me as this religious man. It wasn't easy to go to a Christian school where I, I didn't grow up as a Christian, so I was kind of the outcast. These things were not easy, but yet they were easy because when I put my focus on Christ, it was just a walk in the park because I was near to him because I knew who he was. But when I started to look at them is when it got hard. So we have to remain in Jesus at all times. So what do you think Paul's going to do? Verse 12 again, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, and he's in prison, so you expect him to say that things are bad. Things have turned out to the worst. But is it? Maybe he's not going to say things have turned out for the worst, but maybe he's going to flip it around and say things have actually turned out for the betterment. And that is, in fact, what he says. I want you to know, brothers, so what it says, verse 12, brothers and sisters, and we know he's talking to the church because of Philippians 1, 
to the saints, the overseers, and the deacons, to the entire church. And he's saying, in this point, at this point in, the, in his sentence, he goes, okay, pay attention. Listen up very closely. Do not miss this part. I want you to know this, to comprehend it, to, to live it out. That what has happened to me, I've been arrested for the gospel. I've been arrested for preaching Jesus. I am in prison now. But this hasn't halted the gospel. This has not stopped the gospel. In fact, this has advanced the gospel. It has furthered the gospel. It has done great things for the gospel. And he's excited and he's trying to tell the church these things. It, it has really advanced the gospel. To advance some Bibles, the furtherance of the gospel. It's this picture of you know, the, the people behind, behind the animals and the plow, and, and, and they're, they're advancing into the, the dirt going forward. It's the picture of the pioneers that when they meet the forest and they're trying to make it through the forest, they're cutting down trees and these sorts of things to get deeper into the forest. Maybe you've watched the TV shows of some of the survival shows or just a, a show on the forest and they have these big machetes and they start chopping down vines and chopping the grass away so that they can get deeper into the forest. This is the picture Paul is using. My imprisonment has not stopped the gospel, but it's actually advanced it. We're going further. We're going deeper deeper we're going greater so do not be upset church that i am in prison because the gospel is advancing that's good news now at this point most preachers would say this they'd bring it to you to you the people and they would probably say something like this maybe not most preachers but some preachers and a whole lot of people would do this they'd say now listen this is what the scripture says I'm going to be a motivational speaker now. See, when things turn bad in your life, when, when you're in the pit, when things have turned upside down, you just hold on because God's working something good in there. That's not what that says. That's not how you apply that text. But people will do that. And when they do that, they see that and they say, okay, that's, that's, that's good news. I'm excited. I like this church. I like this preacher. He makes me feel good. And next week when I come back, I'm going to get some more motivation for these things. That's not what it's saying. And guess what will happen when you live your life out thinking that, and then that fails, what you will say is God's word has failed. And when you say God's word has failed, you would say God has failed. But the truth is God cannot fail. He cannot lie. He cannot do these things. He is always truthful without error. His word is, with, is truthful without error because God is truthful without error. So if we see an error in the scriptures, it's not the scriptures, it's our interpretation of the scriptures. So I'm not going to preach that to you, even though it's exciting and it feels a little bit motivational, because that's out of context. This is not what God is telling us in this passage. Now, he might be saying that in another passage. We may come to that one day, but not here. We must keep reading to find out how we're to apply this to our lives, to what this means for our lives. Look how the gospel is, is advancing. Verse 13, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So first he says, look, the gospel is being heard by the guards and by those others that the guards are talking to. So it's advancing by being heard. And then verse 14, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He's saying, look, the, the gospel is advancing. Even though I'm in prison, people are now hearing the gospel. And people are now preaching the gospel. Let's take this hearing the gospel first. Who is he surrounded by? Guards or a guard. It says that, that he, he was likely chained to a guard. He was chained to a guard. So if you're a guard and you're chained to Paul, uh, maybe it, just think about your regular life. You ever been in the store at a coffee shop or something and you're sitting there and you're kind of in the vicinity, the area of someone and you're not, you're not purposely 
trying to listen in on their conversation. You're just sitting there, but you can just hear their conversation and, and you hear everything. So if a guard is chained to Paul and Paul has a visitor and Paul's talking about Jesus and how excited he is about Jesus and how Jesus changes your life and how Jesus wants this for your life, and he's talking to them about the love, and, and he says uh, the affection that he had for this church in Philippi. And if he's talking about these things, then the guard naturally is what? Overhearing these things. Not only that, he may be actually listening on purpose, because these aren't like no ordinary guards. These are the higher up guards, maybe like FBI, uh, Secret Service kind of guys. So they're purposely listening to Paul. But we know who Paul is. Paul is excited about Jesus. So they're not just listening, overhearing. They're not just purposely listening. But Paul's like, hey, you, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Think about that. They're, they're chained to Paul. Now, I said that right. Paul's not chained to the guard. The guard is chained to Paul. Because Paul is someone who's been changed by Jesus so much that he desires to conform to Jesus by committing his life to his mission. That is, telling people about Jesus. That's what he was doing, place to place, city to city, region to region. They arrest him, trying to shut him up. They put him in prison. And he's like, wait, you, you're going to put me in prison and tie me up to a guard who doesn't know about Jesus, these guys that are extremely hard to even talk to, and you're going to let me just sit around with him and talk to him all day? You better believe I'm talking to him about Jesus. This was Paul. This is wonderful. That's why he's excited. Imagine us as a church, as a people. We're trying to reach Haskell and all the surrounding cities with the news of Jesus. And sometimes they don't want to hear it. We go knock on their door. They shut the door in our face. We call them. They hang up. And we're trying to do these things because we're trying to offer them what real life is about. And we just keep getting denied, denied, denied. And then a tornado comes through Haskell. And it destroys many, many houses. And because of that, there's people who have to come and now temporarily live in this building. This is a building where the church meets. So now they're here, and we get to love on them, show them who Jesus is, get to tell them who Jesus is. So what looks like a tragedy is actually a great blessing. Paul saying, it's not a tragedy that I'm in prison. It is a great blessing because I am getting to preach to people that are hard to reach. The gospel is reaching places that have, it has never reached before. And he tells the Philippians this. Philippians, do not be upset. Be excited. Be excited about what is going on here. Paul truly cares about people. Think about that. He's in prison. And he doesn't even care about his situation. He cares about the person beside him in prison. And when he tells that person the gospel, that guard goes and tells someone else the gospel. And they find out Paul's just in prison for preaching Jesus. He didn't do anything wrong. And so Paul's excited about people hearing the gospel because he knows that they are in bondage. They don't even know what life is about. Ephesians 2, he knows that they are dead. They do not know the God of this world, and he wants them to know this God because he is a great, beautiful, loving, kind God. So Paul is excited here. He wants to tell them about Jesus. Now listen, some of you are Christians. Some of you are not. Either way, I care about you. Paul had an affection for these people. I have an affection for you. And I don't even know every one of you, but I care about you. Because some of you are Christians, but you're not understanding what it looks like to live with Christ every day. And I want you to have that because it's great. And our God is great. Some of you do not know God, and I want you to come to know him for the first time because he is great. He is beautiful. So Paul is excited. 
because people are hearing the gospel. But he's not only excited because people are hearing the gospel, he's excited because people are now preaching the gospel. So if Paul was out there, okay, in the cities and in the places, and he's preaching the gospel, but now he's arrested and taken away, now there's just big hole there, what happens? Either people don't preach the gospel, or people fill his spot and preach the gospel. Now, because Paul was preaching in prison, and they hear about these good things, some of them are like, I want to go preach the gospel because this is exciting what Jesus is doing. So they go and fill Paul's spot, and now they're out there preaching. That's what he says, verse 14. Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord, they have confidence in God, by my imprisonment, because I'm in prison preaching the gospel, they are more, even more bold to speak the word without fear. Now they're out there preaching the gospel. So this is great. This is great. Now, now what you're hearing right now is God gospel glory god gospel glory and and if you don't know christ or if you're not close in a relationship with him this is very boring to you but if you know him then you know this is everything what he is saying this is everything some of you say you're kind of weird for thinking you love like you you just speak about god in a a weird you're kind of just weird Say, it's because you have not found God. And here's the reality. I know that I'm weird about God. I'm not foolish. I'm still um, normal, I guess you can say. But I'm normal enough to say that I'm weird about Christ and I'd rather be weird than normal. And he's he's excited here because people are preaching about God. But he, he lists two types of people. In verse 14, he talks about these people being confident in the Lord. They're bold to preach. Um, Verse 16, he says that they do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. Um, He says these people do it out of love. They want to. They want to hear people uh, respond to the gospel. But then he describes another set of people. In verse 15, he says some do, you know, they're preaching Christ, but they do it from envy. They're jealous of me. They're jealous that I get the fame, and they want to become more famous. They want to be known. They, they have pride issues where they say, well, I can do those things too. So they do it out of envy and rivalry. They do it out of uh, not sincere thinking, but they do it to afflict me in prison, to make me bothered. But let me tell you, I'm not bothered by it. I'm actually excited because they're preaching Christ. So he names two people. Those that do it from the right motivation and those that do it from the wrong motivation. Let me ask you a question this morning. You're here in a Sunday gathering where where we sing praises to God. We give back to God some of our energy, some of our money, some of our, just our, our worship to him. And now we're under his word, listening to what he says. What are you motivated by? What are you motivated by? Why are you here? Is it because you truly love God, you desire to know more about him, you want more, you cannot get enough, or is it because you fill in the blank? Is it because if you're a young one, my parents just brought me here? Is it because, well, society, my culture, the people I hang around with, they'll think I'm a bad person if I don't go to church. I don't really believe all stuff, I just come and attend. What motivates you to come here? What motivates you to follow God? I hope that it would be a good motivation. If it's not, then repent. That means turn from those things and turn back to Christ. He'll forgive you. He'll forgive you. But Paul here, he talks about two people, but notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say they're preaching a false gospel. He doesn't say they're preaching falsely about Jesus. He says the people with right motives and the people with wrong motives, they're both preaching the truth of Jesus. And because of that, that's why he rejoices. Because even in the wrong, they have wrong motives and wrong thinking and wrong uh, uh, motivations. They're still preaching the truth of Jesus and Like I said a couple weeks ago, God uses a crooked stick to make a straight line. These envious people, these rivalry people, these afflicting people, because they're preaching the truth that people are going to respond to the gospel even though they have wrong motives. So, bless God. 
bless God that these things are happening. Verse 18. Look at your text. It says this. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Paul finds joy in his situation because the gospel and God and the glory of God are being heard by guards and people that were hard to hear and other people are now proclaiming Christ whether they do it rightly in the right motivation or wrong motivation it is all about the gospel so I'm still clear it up for me a little bit clear it up it's a little muddy okay you ready said this in the beginning Paul was a Jewish man a very religious strict man trying to be made right with God one day going down the road Christ reveals himself to Paul Paul goes I'm doing this all wrong Jesus paid my price Jesus forgives me for my sin it's not about what I do it's about what he's done thank you for doing this I am no longer a criminal. I am now a child of God. He's changed by Jesus. And because of that, he wants to live a life where he's looking like Jesus. That's conforming to him in his everyday life. And, and he wants other people to hear about the good news that you can be changed also. So he's committed to Jesus' mission, which Jesus came to save the lost. And so he's out there preaching the gospel, preaching Jesus. This is his whole life, and he's going city to city, region to region, place to place. And they try to shut him up and they put him in prison. So the bad situation looks like it's turned worse because now he can't speak. But he's tied to the guard and he's like, wait a minute. I'm tied to this person who doesn't know about God, doesn't know the good news, doesn't know what true life is about. Let me introduce them to God through the gospel so that God would be glorified. The guards hear it, and now they're going out to other people and doing, preaching the same thing, or they're hearing the gospel. Not only that, other people are filling Paul's place, and now they're preaching the gospel so that people can hear about God, and God would be glorified, and people would be, uh, um, find their true life in him. So at the end of it, Paul goes, look, I rejoice in all of this because it's all about God, and God is being proclaimed in all places. This is good news church philippi don't worry that i'm imprisoned it's all good it has advanced the good news of gospel so how are we to apply this to our lives that's the question how do we take this written 2000 years ago and apply it to our life what is it that god wants us to hear how do we respond in situations like this it's very simple Ready? You remain in Jesus. You remain in him. That is knowing Christ. That's what Paul was doing. No matter what situation he was in, he always had his relationship with God first. When he was floating around in the sea, he was still with God. When he was getting beat on the back, he was still with God. When he was getting beat, he was thinking, wow, I, I can't believe I'm getting beat like my Savior was getting beat. I am so unworthy to be beaten this way. Paul had the relationship of knowing God. And out of that, that motivated him to tell people about God through the gospel. And when people responded to the gospel, they praised God where God got the glory and so no matter what situation, he's in a bad situation here. He's been in good situations. It is the same thing. He knows God. He wants to make him known because it's about God, his gospel, and his glory. And until you and I can be about God because of the gospel for his glory, we will never find joy like he found in any situation we find ourselves in. See, we want joy. We want peace. We want love. We want these good things. And you seek them out in all the wrong things. See, Paul doesn't even say, you want joy? Go find joy. Uh, uh, seek Jesus for joy. Seek Jesus for peace. Seek 
Jesus in this. He is saying this. No. Just simply seek Jesus and the result will be joy. Seek Jesus and the result will be love. Seek Jesus, the result will be confidence. Seek Jesus and the result you will find what life is all about. It is all about Jesus. It's all about God. So this morning, for your Christians who have swayed, or for your Christians that are excited, the key, the answer is to seek Jesus for who Jesus is. And when you do that, you will find the hope that you're looking for. You'll find the energy in which you need once again. You'll find the faithfulness in which you need. You'll find the forgiveness in which you are seeking. But you simply seek Jesus, not those things. And if you are lost, this means, what do you mean lost? You don't know this God that I've been talking about. It means you're still separated from him. The good news is that Jesus came so that you no longer have to be separated from him, but that you can return to him because of what Jesus did. And he says, put your faith in Jesus. See, seek Jesus. When you seek him, you'll have eternal life. You'll understand what a life worth living is about. And when we do that, God is glorified. Very simple. God, gospel, glory. If we seek Jesus, the result will be the fruit. But don't seek Jesus for the fruit. Seek Jesus for Jesus.